I'm Jen McCann, and I am the director for the U.S. Coastal Programs at the URI Coastal Resources Center, um, and also the director of extension for Rhode Island Sea Grant College Program. And uh, we want to uh, again thank you for participating in um, this the 17th annual Ronald C. Baird um, Sea Grant Science Symposium. And Ron is here someplace. So um, Ron is in our virtual community right now. So thank you, Ron, for being a part of um, this discussion and um, many others. So um, one reason, the reason why we're, we chose this topic is, as many of you know, um, offshore renewable energy is growing um, at a rapid pace here in the United States. And over the next 10 years, it's going to grow even more rapidly and both on land and um, offshore. And we have state and local decision makers, resource users, and other end, end users who are struggling to keep up with, with the, the most current information and with decisions they are having to make um, on, this, on this topic, um, whether it be from a recreational perspective or from a, an economic perspective or a multi-use strategy perspective. So um, in addition, um, in January, I was able to attend um, a meeting at UNH that BOEM held um, to jumpstart the, the growth of offshore renewable energy um, in the Gulf of Maine. And while I was listening, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, these are the same questions that we have asked in Rhode Island since 2007 and 2008. So they're, they're very good questions, um, but I felt we really needed to do a better job to learn from each other and to share um, experiences and words of wisdom. And I know that some of this is happening, um, but we thought that this was a great opportunity to, um, to share uh, some of this information today. Um, I want to thank um, some of our co-hosts um, co here um, and co-sponsors um, here. Again, you know, this is put on by Rhode Island Sea Grant. Um, uh, we want to thank the Graduate School of Oceanography. Um, I believe Dean Corliss is online as well, so thank you, uh, Bruce, uh, for participating. And also for this, this um, series, we um, are partnering with the, um, the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, um, their working group on the marine benthal and renewable energy development. Um, they're an amazing group of international researchers working on this topic. And um, they will be um, many of the presenters for the next um, webinars that we will be hosting and more on that. And then again, we wanna thank District Hall for bringing us into the 21st century and um, helping us with this, um, with this virtual um, opportunity. Um, when our panelists got together for our pre-meeting, we decided we wanted to focus the conversation to make sure it was um, relevant and more concrete. So because the Gulf of Maine is, um, but because the Gulf of Maine is really um, to some degree a, a blank slate right now when it comes to offshore renewable energy, we decided that not the people, I will say, just the fact that we're looking and exploring offshore renewable energy. Um, we decided that we wanted to, if the presenters, when they talk about experiences and words of wisdom and lessons learned, to potentially direct some of that information to, um, to their colleagues in the Gulf of Maine. Um, in addition, our group agreed that we would, in particular, focus on the planning phase of offshore renewable energy. Um, clearly, we can stray from that, but we would encourage we focus on that part of the planning phase. Um, with that, I want to um, introduce our panelists. And what I'm going to do is maybe I'll say your name, and then um, if you could, panelists, um, uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what your relationship, what is your role or what is your relationship with offshore wind? Um, so Mary, do you, Mary Boatman, do you want to start? Hello. Sure. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Um, this is Mary Boatman and I work for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and I know this is a wide ranging group. So BOM is a 
uh, an agency within the Department of the Interior, the federal government. And our responsibility is for leasing and then ultimately reviewing the construction operations plans put forth by developers. So we're responsible for that process that allows for offshore wind to move forward. Um, my particular role is that as a science coordinator or studies chief within the Boehm Renewable Energy Program along the Atlantic is to uh, listen to the public to hear what are, are the questions are that need to be addressed um, and as well as our other SMEs collecting that information and working to, to prioritize that information and go out and collect the types of data so we can understand the environment better and then to bring that information to the table for the decision makers through our internal processes as well as the public processes such as the marine cadaster or the regional ocean data portals. So it's all about collecting the information or data we may need to make these decisions, putting it together into a format that can be used and making it available to the public so everybody has the opportunity to share the same information. So that's basically my role. Great, thank you, Mary. And um, Annie Hawkins, would you like to introduce yourself? Or, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many people on the call, um, especially neat to see so many of our colleagues from Europe joining the call. This is fun. Um, and I know we're, we're hoping to have more sort of international exchange from the fisheries side, so it's a great start. Um, my name is Annie Hawkins. I'm the Executive Director of the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, or RODA. Um, we're a fishing industry association. We were formed in June of 2018. Um, and really came out of a core group of us that were working with the fishing industry or um, commercial people who are commercial fishermen themselves and um, who had been engaged in the offshore wind process and other ocean planning processes for, for a while um, and really felt that there would be benefit to, to the fishing industry to speak together with one voice on issues that were common amongst the fleet. Um, in about a year and a half since we were formed, we've grown very quickly. We have over 170 members in the U.S. And we really started in southern New England and the Mid-Atlantic, um, largely in response to the rapid growth of these projects, um, and, and very quickly expanded also to the West Coast and now to the Gulf of Maine. So um, we do this full time. We have three staff members at Rhoda, um, and we work on engagement, communications, and uh, scientific processes to improve fishermen's representation in the leasing process. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Annie. Uh, um, Grover? Hi, I'm Grover Fugate. I'm the Executive Director of the Coastal Resources Management Council. Uh, my role was essentially project lead uh, for the planning process for the Ocean SAMP. Um, in fact, I was the only one that actually participated from our agency uh, in the development of that. The rest of the were you derived people that were working on the project. Um, from there, we developed a set of regulations and also policies that we adopted through the federal consistency process that, us, that allow us to reach out into federal waters. Uh, the regulations for the Block Island project allowed us to not only to oversee the permitting of that project, but then during the construction process, we oversaw the construction and now the maintenance and operation of that project as it goes forward. Um, we have also issued decisions on the, or decision on the vineyard project one that is, um, we have other projects under review uh, from Orsted and Vineyard that we're, we're working through now. The tools that we're using to do that are uh, through the federal consistency process. Uh, there are a series of enforceable policies that we use to review those projects against and measure them to make sure that they're uh, reducing their impact to Rhode Island ocean users uh, while we're still developing the industry itself. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, Grover. John? Hey, good morning, everyone. Can, can you hear me, Jen? Yes. Great. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Jen and, and C. Grant, URI, CIC, for, for putting this together and, and having us. It's also great to see a lot of uh, familiar faces, uh, even though it's, it's on this virtual quilt of, uh, of faces. And I, I have to say, this is probably much more comfortable uh, than sitting in front of a few hundred people uh, public speaking. <laughs> it's much more comfortable to do it from your, your living room. So uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're, you're, you're in Europe. Um, just quickly on my background, 
I was a sailor for about uh, 15 years, worked in, uh, as a professional mariner, uh, worked in wind quite a bit as, as I worked on large sailing vessels. Um, I went to, to URI and got my master's of marine affairs and then started to work for deep water wind back then and was involved in the construction of the Block Island Wind Farm. Uh, I then took over uh, as manager of operations and maintenance at Block Island uh, for the first about two and a half years of its of its life, and now I head up uh, I head up the Marine Affairs Department for Orsted, and the Marine Affairs Department is uh, is a group of uh, unique group of maritime professionals, fishermen, uh, and, and others offshore wind professionals uh, that we work with all maritime stakeholders, marine stakeholders like the, the US Coast Guard, uh, fishermen, commercial recreational, uh, commercial shipping, folks, folks like that. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you, John. And um, I just wanna say a little bit about Eric. Eric, we're, we're calling, he's sort of our stakeholder today. And so Eric is also going, um, Eric is sort of uh, represents the whole Gulf of Maine and um, he is sort of, we're, again, we're putting this conversation through the filter of the Gulf of Maine. So Eric gets to interrupt or ask specific questions as we're having this dialogue. So Eric, could you introduce yourself? And then you're gonna give a little summary of the Gulf of Maine. Absolutely, thanks, Jen. Um, I'll put the slide up just to start. Um, yeah, my name is Eric Chapman. I'm the director of, of New Hampshire Sea Grant. I know we have a large um, audience, but, um, like Rhode Island Sea Grant, uh, New Hampshire Sea Grant's a part of uh, a network of 34 programs that are based in coastal states and Great Lakes states. Um, New Hampshire Sea Grant is a partnership between UNH and the National Sea Grant Office, and we, our, our role is to, to integrate research, extension, education, and outreach um, to address societal issues that affect coastal communities and coastal and marine ecosystems. And, and, and so we're very much, um, in the center of issues like offshore wind. Um, we essentially belong to the people of New Hampshire and so we work on their behalf to make connections to help enable them to address you know, important issues that affect their world. Um, this is a, a, um, a, a picture of the Gulf of Maine. Just a, Jen asked me to do a little bit just to orient folks who aren't from uh, around this area, but I think we're very similar to other areas and very much as Jen mentioned, representative of places where offshore wind development planning is occurring, but it's very much in its early stages. So there's no offshore wind development in the Gulf of Maine, but the train most definitely is coming. So we're, we're hearing the rumors, we're reading articles, we're learning as much as we can. And compared to other people who've been involved in this for much longer, we're, we're sort of in the dark and, and asking a lot of questions and doing the best we can to, to prepare for what's gonna be hitting us or is hitting us as we speak. So. Um, this symposium is perfect for us. We're really excited about uh, very much learning as much as we can from lessons learned um, from other folks who have been around this issue for, for a much longer period. So the Gulf of Maine is also similar, I think, to a lot of other areas. Um, it's a very, very productive uh, ecosystem um, for a lot of different reasons that I won't go into right now. Um, and, you know, it has a long history fed feeding native cultures for centuries. And ultimately, um, this productivity is really what drove European expansion um, and to North America over 500 years ago. So we have a long history, um, a very important relationship with our ecosystem services connected to the, the Gulf of Maine. And like other areas, nothing happens in the Gulf of Maine without a fight. So certainly nothing new happens. And even without offshore wind, um, marine spatial planning and resource management um, is very contentious. So we've, we have a lot going on. Um, it, with respect to our, our lobster and ground fish uh, fisheries, which support a lot of our coastal communities, um, shipping, tourism, aquaculture starting to poke its head into the, to the, uh, um, to the marine spatial planning uh, uh, situation more in coastal areas at this point. Um, we have endangered species issues, very significant ones. We are down to a few hundred right whales that spend a lot of their time in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and all of this is happening in the face of, of a system that's um, facing a lot of climate change effects, you know, population growth, all in, uh, forms of old and new po uh, forms of pop pollution are, are at play. So it's very, very contentious. Um, new Hampshire, uh, our governor in January 2019 requested um, a task force be formed 
to explore offshore wind. Um, uh, and, and that request went to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, offshore um, energy management. And uh, the task force was formed. And as Jen mentioned, we had a kickoff in a year later in January 2020 at University of New Hampshire. So we're very much at the center of like the political and geographical center of what's going on in the Gulf of Maine. That meeting was really, really interesting because everybody showed up um, and we learned a lot about what we face and a lot of the passion and interest um, and the questions that people have about what's ahead of them. The governor and his point person showed up and were extremely excited about the economic uh, opportunities, the opportunities of improving our energy independence. Um, fishermen showed up, they were extremely worried about what's headed uh, their direction. They're hearing stories of um, that aren't very encouraging about how their needs will be addressed through the process, so they're very concerned about that. Um, energy companies are, are, are really looking at this as an important area of, of developing their businesses and addressing important national and local interests around the energy um, uh, um, uh, self-sufficiency. Mechanical workers and marine industries were represented and they're seeing a very important opportunity, but they're also concerned about uh, local interests being and local folks benefiting from the economic development that's going to occur as a result of offshore wind. Um, climate mitigation activists showed up and they're extremely passionate and they want to move big and they want to move fast um, because of the uh, impending um, impacts of global warming. Shipping industry and fishermen were represented and they're interested in main, maintaining, of course, their travel routes and access to uh, their, their, uh, the areas that they need in the ocean to support their livelihoods. Um, I'm a part of a university communi community, so we're wondering and interested, how can we help? What sort of research extension engagement um, can we be involved in and support to, su to, to support a successful process that works for uh, the people of New Hampshire? Um, and the rest of the Gulf of Maine, what data is needed, what processes work, what don't work, what doesn't work, um, how can we be creative and resourceful and be inspired by the information and knowledge from people who have more experience. So we're all ears. We're very much looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have today. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to ask some questions of these panelists who represent, you know, some important uh, segments of, uh, and players. Uh, we have counterparts here in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Maine. So we're very much looking forward to this discussion. Thanks. Great, thank you, Eric. That was very comprehensive. We really appreciate that. So, um, Grover, I'm gonna ask you to go first, but what I would like, remember there's more, you're not the only panelist. <laughs> um, could you tell us one thing, right? That, it, well, first of all, I wanna recognize Ken Payne. Ken Payne is here. Ken was our stakeholder guru um, leader um, for the Ocean Sand. So, so Ken Payne, thank you very much for participating in this uh, uh, webinar. Grover, can you give us one tool that you felt was extremely effective? Um, again, you're like the grandfather of, of offshore wind here in the Northeast. What, what words of wisdom, what advice or tool would you uh, recommend the Gulf of Maine put in place? Well, I think the ocean sample, what we've learned in the past is the, the amount of conflict or problems that you have uh, will be um, proportional to the effort that you put into planning up front. That is, the more planning you put up front, the less conflict and problems you will have on the backside when you go to try to get those projects through the approval process. Um, the Ocean Stamp certainly taught us that. Um, it's a lesson that we believe is still valuable, but um, to the extent that you can find out what the uses are, what the resources are, what the existing use patterns are, those all are very valuable pieces of information as you go forward into trying to get these projects through an approval process. Um, so I think one of the, the important lessons, obviously, is um, the amount of pre-planning you do will lessen your pain on the backside. Who should be doing that planning, Grover? Well, I, you know, there's a split, obviously, in the jurisdiction between state and federal waters. I will say that we jumped out into federal waters and did the planning ourselves, even though people said that we shouldn't be out in the federal waters. Um, 
we did that because we, uh, your users uh, from your coastal state are out in those waters. What you're trying to do is find out who those users are, to what extent they're using those resources, and also the value of those resources so that you can understand how these potential projects may impact those uses. Uh, you have to understand the federal government, particularly the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, has a much more narrow focus uh, when they're looking at these things and not as broad as the state might. So I think one of the, uh, the things that I would say to any states that are out there is again, um, if you want to have a say in this process and you want it to be meaningful, you need to start doing that now. You need to start that data collection. You need to start understanding your users and how they use that area. And you need to start building policies within your program that you might be able to extend out into federal waters through the federal consistency process. We spent a lot of time on that uh, in the ocean sand. We also have what's called a geographic location description, which allows us to expand in sort of a pro forma basis uh, out to federal waters. Um, our authority to look at these projects, we've amended that GLD to encompass more area. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time doing that and it is proved fruitful to us um, to be able to have a meaningful say within the process. So uh, while the feds, obviously there are many entities that could undertake that type of thing, really the states are the ones that are gonna bear the brunt of the impacts and the ones that need to think about it. Eric, Jen, do you, do you mind if I ask a quick question? We can get to the other panelists, but I do wanna ask a quick question. So, um, New Hampshire fishermen are co-mingling with Massachusetts and Maine and probably Rhode Island fishermen as well um, in the areas that are be considered in the Gulf of Maine. So, and these are in federal waters. Any tips on how the state should consider working together or what might work best in terms of doing some of this planning in a way that's coordinated? The other states uh, obviously have an interest in this, but each state will vary in its interest, I think, in, in, in accordance with its, particularly its fishery itself. Um, the fishery in Maine, I would suggest, is probably a little different than the fishery in Massachusetts, certainly different than the fishery in Rhode Island. Um, so a lot of that data collection and whatnot has to be uh, to that end. So it has to be very specific to your area. When the projects come in and they're in your state waters, um, they're gonna wanna know what the potential impact is to your fishery and what the value of that fishery is. One of the things that I think um, we could have spent more time on in trying to deal with is assessing the value of that fishery because that becomes very important in the discussions later on as to what the potential impacts are. But again, this, a lot of this, uh, while it's good to be cooperative, when you get into the process itself, it becomes very project specific, very state specific. Thank you. So Grover, do you feel, I, I, I noticed that in the Gulf of Maine, each state has their own um, advisory committees. Uh, uh, is that, are they, well, one, are they coordinating? And but what I'm hearing you say is maybe that's a good thing that each one has their own habitat advisory committee and each one has their own, I don't know, fisheries or, or marine mammal advisory committee. Is that, is that the way to go or should there be coordination at that level as well? Well, when we formulated the FAB, our fishermen's advisory body, um, we brought in participants from the state of Massachusetts as part of that board. Um, they have not been very active because the projects that we've been reviewing so far impact Rhode Island fishery. But we did bring in other fishermen from other states into that board. The other thing that's different is Rhode Island made our board part of our regulatory scheme so that the fishermen have a much greater say in the process than if they were just a pure advisory body on the outside. So there are differences that do exist uh, between the states, even though they may be cooperating um, on, on this fishery issue. So maybe one lesson is Eric is, although each state has their own independent advisory committee, that there's a process to ensure that there's coordination um, between at that level. Maybe that's something to identify. Yeah. Annie, since we're talking about fisheries, do you want to chime in here? 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I think the interstate coordination uh, is, is sort of a, a key challenge here um, and, and frankly something that's, that's been missing overall. And I'm not saying that to malign any one state or Grover's work of the Fed or anything like that. But um, as far as looking at a lot, you know, an early planning process in a lot of these projects, um, you know, we have BOEM as the federal agency who d does the permitting process, right, is in charge of permitting and reviewing the permitting steps. And we have some states that have, like Rhode Island, that have really taken the lead on planning, upfront planning, um, but with a relatively narrow state focus by, because, because it has to be that way, I mean, by design, right? So states can manage for their state you, uh, state citizens, state fisheries, state impacts, but um, there has not been a regional planning process that involved fishermen. There have been other regional planning processes for various uses, um, but fishermen were not involved in that. And I think that that, you know, is sort of both the answer to this question in terms of what needs to happen and also looking forward to the Gulf of Maine. Um, the permitting process was not designed to address planning issues. There are things that cannot be resolved during the you know now limited to two-year timeline um, of reviewing an environmental impact statement. Those things have to be done before, during, and after project construction. I mean, there's a lot of mechanisms that are sort of lacking to do that in an effective way. Um, despite you know Rhode Island being very comprehensive with the SAMP and being very far ahead of of where other states are, but what we saw play out with the FAB process was that that was applicable to Rhode Island fishermen but fishermen from other states that are fishing in that area weren't included in that process because it was a Rhode Island state process or they weren't fully completely included in the way. I know again that the state did sort of go out of their way to, to open those meetings to fishermen from other states, but in terms of the actual negotiations, the project design, the considerations, that was that, was that one state. And you know, it makes fishermen and it makes me very worried what happens when you have projects off of New York Bite that impact Rhode Island fishermen and, and the SAMP does not apply in the same way, you know, then what's gonna happen? So I, I really think there's sort of a missing missing element altogether here um, that, you know, we've certainly with, with Rhoda been requesting for the Gulf of Maine and that we'd really like to see develop in advance of any decisions, including siting, um, because siting is the most important decision, particularly when you're looking at floating winds. Um, you know, another thing I would add it to be a little more positive in terms of, you know, things that do work and where we have seen um, progress uh, is when people work with fishermen and ask them specific questions, right? Um, there have been a lot of meetings that fishermen are asked to do, um, that fishing industry representatives are asked to go to, and none of these people are full-time planning people, right? Um, there are a lot of people um, from the states, from the federal government, from wind companies and consultants whose full-time job is to plan for these things. There are no fishermen whose full-time job is to plan for these things. Um, and they go to meetings and they get the same spiel over and over again. I mean, I, you know, I, <laughs> if you ask any fisherman that's been to any of these meetings, how many times have they seen the little diagram of the bone leasing process? They've seen it, they know it. They're not so worried about what is the bone leasing process anymore, right? There are very, very specific conflicts and interactions that they have information that they wanna to bring to bear, um, that they wanna actually talk about those things. And even, in places where we see projects very far advanced, we haven't seen, we've seen a lot of the regulatory processes on the state and federal level, they really haven't gotten into those project questions. I mean, that's come down to the fishermen and the developers to do, um, but how that syncs up with a permitting process can be really, really hard. I mean, I'm sure John can probably speak to that more, probably as usual, doesn't agree with everything I say, but I think there are some shared challenges that um, you know, I, I think we can all speak to. Jen, can I have one thing? Yeah, please. One of the things that, um, in hindsight, that we probably should have included is that it's not just the fishermen, it's the processing side. Um, so a lot of uh, the fishermen obviously are out there actively pursuing their fisheries in these, in these waters, but ultimately they bring that back to a port. And there's not just impacts to the fishermen, there are also impacts to the port that need to be considered uh, in addition to the, the impacts to the fishermen themselves. So Annie, on that point, and, and Eric, I, Eric, you can interject whenever I'm interjecting, you interject, okay, um, Eric, anytime. But so Annie, what you're, are you, what, what are you saying that, um, I know you, your job to some degree is to serve as a, 
a consistent and a, a uniform voice, and again, I understand that that's difficult for the commercial fishing industry. So is that correct? I, I don't want to, um, so, so yeah, what, in, go ahead. So I, I guess my, my question is, is so what would you like to have sort of, is it, would it, and I'm sure you're doing this, you're clearly defining the the site the locations and the the um the, the activity taking place in the gulf of maine already or what is your role now what would you like to, what is one thing you'd like to see yeah so yeah so to sort of back to Grover's point so yeah when i say fishermen and fishing industry in Rhode Island, you know we really don't have one word we, we involve processors harvesters uh, fishing communities any fishing dependent business um, or association is, is is sort of who, who we're speaking for and who we work with. Um, and that's very broad. And, and what we see, of course, is there's processes all, you know, with, with wind, with other things. Sometimes larger boats and processors are very well accounted for in things and smaller boats are not and vice versa. And so we try to bridge that gap and make sure that, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats here and everyone's included. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of, you know, what we're, we're hoping to see, so, even compared to southern New England, you know, the Gulf of Maine has some serious data limitations in their fisheries. There's just a lot of data poor fisheries, data poor stocks. Lobster fishery is a really obvious example and where you don't have a lot of inform a lot of spatial information compared to some other US managed fisheries, right? So that is going to be a really, really serious issue to wrap everyone's heads around because um, some tools that have been used uh, in other regions, like you know, for the, the data portals, um, certain work by the states that that we've seen become very uh, contentious. Looking at other fisheries and people saying, "Oh, you know, even though my boat uses VMS or, or uses AMS or AIS, rather, um, you know, that's not showing my activity." We have vessels up in the Gulf of Maine that don't that don't use either, and really don't have any information. And so, how do we start to look at that? And yes, I do believe that the fishermen need to get together and start wrapping their own heads around how they can present their information in ways um, because they know where they are, right? And they can present that in ways if you work with them effectively. But the key here is that that takes a lot of time. And it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of resources to get people together and wrap your head around how to engage in those kind of efforts to get the, that information to feed into a planning process and then afterwards into the permitting process, right? Because the permitting process is only specific projects. And as much as, you know, the fishermen haven't, in a lot of cases, been given the time and heads up, it, it's one thing to say to someone, hey, you know, in five years, there might be offshore wind, you know, offshore wind facilities here, and then five years later, come back and say, oh, I told you five years ago. But they need specific questions and specific things they can be working on and know where that's going to fit in the process. And that decisions and planning and, and the reality is actually going to change as a result of the participation to min mitigate impacts, right? And that's where there's a real disconnect is that it's, it's not necessarily lining up on the process um, yeah. and on the timeline. And so, you know, it, it's not just fishermen either. It's also fisheries experts. What we've seen is, you know, the National Marine Fisheries Service has never had a single dollar appropriated towards working on offshore wind and fisheries interactions. To the best of my knowledge, none of the state fisheries agencies have ever had any money appropriated towards working on this specific issue. And that's a problem, right? When you have the experts that know the fishery, the experts that know what data is out there, and the scientists that could be working with that, could be working cooperatively with fishermen to start to answer these questions, and nobody has time or money or resources to do it. That's a real issue. Annie, I have a quick follow-up before we can get to the other panelists about the fishermen. So one of the things we've been asked to do is just to make the connection between the state interests and the, and the fishing communities. And so we've, we've made those introductions and, and, um, and and tried to support sort of engagement of, of fishermen in, in the process. And at this point, our, our fishing communities are just under siege. You know, they feel overwhelmed with everything out, you know, before you even start thinking about offshore wind. And what they know about offshore wind doesn't encourage them to, they don't feel encouraged to get involved in, in the process. And at this point, the message we're receiving is they don't even want to be involved in the process because, or some of them, um, because in some ways I think they feel that would acknowledge something that is gonna happen that they don't want to have happen. Um, so 
you know, I'm, I'm curious if you have any suggestions about, um, and we're also very, you know, uh, aware of, of the, the demands that are placed on fishing communities to help solve the problems that are, you know, not really theirs, but are affecting their livelihood. So any tips you have in, in engaging and supporting fishermen through this process? Sure, I, I think it's, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons why, why people are, you know, sort of checking out as, as it were. Um, some people are all across the board, right? You, you certainly still have people that say, well, you, you, there's no point in me engaging because I'm hoping that I can, just, you know, I, I don't want wind projects on my fishing grounds. I'm going to shoot, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm going to stop them otherwise and, and there's no point for me to engage directly. And, and that's fine. I think that at this point, that is not the majority of people. I think there's a perception that most fishermen are behaving that way. Um, but there are a lot of other reasons that fishermen decline to engage in these things. Um, and one is that, you know, like I said, <laughs> I've seen over and over again in various regions, fishermen that go to meeting after meeting after meeting and nothing changes and nothing happens. And they get referred to as stakeholders and they get lectured to for two or three hours. And then in the last few minutes, you know, hey, you've got five minutes, any reactions to the presentations you heard? And honestly, I would stop going to those meetings too, if I were them, even if I didn't have another job. I mean, so part of it is, um, you know, the structure of the engagements. And, and, and again, you know, we've had people, um, there's people on, on this webinar that are, that are listening right now, I know who have been meeting for years and years and years, hundreds of meetings with developers, with BOEM, um, with the regional planning groups, with NIMS, with anyone they can talk to. Um, showing their proprietary data, saying that, you know, these are some suggestions we have to minimize conflicts. And to date, not one of those suggestions has been incorporated into a project design. Those people are going to stop going to meetings. And people up in the Gulf of Maine and in other regions that haven't been doing that are hearing from their colleagues in other places. And they're opting out. That's right. Um, so, you know, I think we need to really rethink how fishermen are in the room where they can plug in and make that as efficient for them as possible and also show them the value of their participation as much as possible by, by actual outcomes. Thank you, Annie. I'm gonna um, go to Mary. Um, Mary, sure. would you like to talk, of, and then John, I know you're there, you're doing great. Um, Mary, can you um, talk a little bit about what do you think some of the tools um, that have been effective? As And, and, and again, Bowen has been in this for a while. I'm sure that um, you have tweaked your process to make sure you're more responsive. Some, what, what are some tools that you feel um, have been useful in uh, the appropriate growth of wind? Well, um, well, first of all, I, I want to somewhat echo and, and stand and agree with Annie in that, you know, initially we went state by state. That's how the process started. Um, we don't initiate a task force, as you just heard, without having a governor send us a letter. It wasn't done regionally. It was done, again, state by state. And as we're all learning, and you know, in the Gulf of Maine, we, we met with three states and brought them together and trying to look at it a more regional way of looking at it than on a state by state basis. Um, but I it, it also want to emphasize the importance of the states being able to go to on the ground and reach out to their constituencies and bring the data and information at their level rather than federal government walking in. We, we have to, we're the, you know, we're a few people with a very big area. You don't have the time and energy that it deserves to be able to get that kind of information. And I would say that the most important thing in the planning process is taking the time and plan, just like Grover said, and for example, Gulf of Maine, we just did the very first step. It's a long journey. Um, and taking that time and making sure all of the issues are brought to the table and then, uh, and then circling back appropriately with, you know, sometimes the answer is, I'm sorry, we can't do something about this, but at least you should turn around and respond back to the person and say, here's why we heard you, but here's the other things that we have to be thinking about. I think good communication all the way down the line about how we heard you, how we responded, perhaps how we didn't or couldn't respond. I think that's and uh, that's critical. And I and I don't know that there's always the time. And you know, we do feel pressed for time. And especially when you're starting in a planning process, I think you should take the time to do the planning thoroughly. And then um, the other part is just sharing the data and having the data and information. It's very easy to have people say, "Oh, say, say something." Um, and 
it's their viewpoint, their opinion, but do they have the data to back it up? It's really important that it be data rich and data based so that we can have appropriate discussions and that we can make good decisions based on it. So I think those are the main things that I'd like to share at the moment. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, do, Eric, do you have a, a question? Or yeah, I do. Um, um, there are a lot of us, you know, we work at the university, but we're also connected to a lot of partners that work in, these, in the space that are really trying to think about how they can best support the process through research extension and engagement. I'd be interested in your, any, any thoughts or ideas or advice you'd give us about the best way to approach some of these things at the university and then from other support organizations, Marie. Jen and, well, and Eric, Eric, if, before we move on, if, if, if I could actually just go back to that last question before we, we, sure. we switch topics. Yeah. Um, and, and, and just give you the developer's point of view, um, and I'll put my developer hat on. So I would say, you know, I, as, as Annie pointed out, we generally, uh, you know, we, we agree on some things and we disagree on others, and that's, and that's a good thing, right? So we're not going to agree on, agree on everything. I think in terms of process, we're talking a lot about process states and federal here. I think it's important to note, um, as a developer, you need to, you know, once you've uh, secured a lease area from, from the government, you need to identify very early the, and I know Annie hates the word stakeholder, but there is no better word, you know, we could, we could, we could say that about everyone, but everyone's a stakeholder, right? We have internal, we have external. Um, it's just, th th there's no way to capture everyone. We're talking about all folks, right? So identify the stakeholders that use the area, that have used the area before, that use it now, that may use it in the future. And once you identify those stakeholders, you need to reach out early and often, right? And, and I know we say that pretty generically, but it's, it's very true. And then not just have discussions, but you need to discuss the project, uh, potential concerns, as well as any potential opportunities that, that there may be as well. I know we focus on the negative quite a bit, but there's a lot of folks out there. And, and, and I just point out when we say fishermen, and I know there's a lot of fishermen on this call and then on this webinar and a lot of folks that I know, when we say fishermen, it's pretty broad. Who are we talking about? Are we talking about commercial fishing? Are we talking about recreational fishing? Within commercial, we know there's there's so many businesses that fall within within that commercial bucket. So, and if you put all those people in the same room, you know, if you put 50, 50 fishermen in the room and, and, and I see Fred up there, so I'll pick on him, but Fred, Fred can disagree with you once, but you, you put 50 commercial fishermen in the room, you're gonna get 49 opinions on, on how things should be done, right? And that's not to say that's not a good thing. That is a good thing, but we have to then take, as a developer, have to try to sort through some of that, right? And then how do we apply that to projects? There's certain fisheries, the, the fixed gear, the mobile, and how, you know, how they want the projects to play out. So all that has to go into the process. We have to understand the use of the area and understand how we can also build a, a viable project. Um, you have to work with those folks, right? You have, to, you have to do all you can to avoid and mitigate. And that's what you're seeing happen now where, and again, it's not a perfect process, but you point me to a perfect process uh, in this country, I'll, I'll be happy to, to hear about it. But what we have to do is understand how to avoid and mitigate for all those different folks, right? Those different stakeholders. And then again, remember that it's not just fishermen either that use that area. So you've got, you've got the Coast Guard and their inputs and you know, their concerns and how they would like to see the project play out. You've got uh, commercial shipping, you've got all the different uses of the ocean. Uh, and we have to, you know, no one's going to feel bad for us, but we have to try to have to try to figure all that out. And again, put together a viable project in our in our lease area. So that process is, you know, I think it's had varied success state by state. Some states have extremely strong processes, like like Rhode Island. Not just because I, I live and work here, but uh, uh, and went to URI. But you know, you're, Rhode Island does have a, a really really strong process in place. The OSAMP is a is an excellent example of, of uh, marine spatial planning. Uh, and has certainly helped uh, along the way. But it is a long process. And I know we say fast and rapid a lot, but let's be honest, you know, Block Island took eight, oh, oh, what, eight years to, to get to uh, construction. We're, we're several years into the process on a lot of different projects. So it, it, it's not a fast process by any means, uh, but I, th I do think it's thorough and it's, it's imperfect, I'll admit. Um, but we have to do the best of what we can and then look for areas to improve. And I think all uh, federal and state agencies struggle with that. 
uh, and there is no perfect way to go about it. But I do think the states need to be involved, the states working groups. But then how do we put that, how do we put that state quilt together? Because as we know, you know, I could be talking about one project in the Northeast, but there might be seven states that are involved in that because there's fishermen from down in the Mid-Atlantic that come up and use that area. Uh, there might be fishermen from New England don't even, don't even use that area at all, but go down to the Mid-Atlantic and work on a different project. So the, you know, the interconnected uses of the ocean, we have to kind of figure all that out. So yes, as Grover pointed out, he made a good point about project specific, state specific, but, at the, but, the, but we also have to figure out how to put the states together and have the states talk. And, and make sure that it's a, a consistent and thorough process. Thanks. Jen, can I jump in for a second? Okay. So a couple of things. First of all, the ocean sand took two years to do. So it doesn't have to be a very long process. And when Deepwater came in, they were in and out the door in nine months with their permit. That's unheard of for a major project like that in the permitting realm. But the other thing is, I just want to make clear to everybody that when a developer gets a lease, the clock has already started to tick on them because they have a certain amount of time that they have to conduct their studies according to their lease documents. Once they get into that process and start spending money, it becomes, time becomes even more valuable to them. And for a state or a fisherman to start to interact once they're into that process, you're under severe time constraints. Uh, the federal consistency process puts a limit on the state of six months to render a decision, otherwise it loses that decision. So to try to undertake some of these very tricky negotiations during that period becomes problematic. And the fishing community gets frustrated because they feel that they're up against a wall in terms of those time uh, constraints that are put on them. Uh, and they feel rushed by those negotiations. So to the extent that a state can leap forward on that and start to move forward on those issues, the better off they will be when it gets into the development phase. Who should be doing that? How, how do you, I mean, the states are- The states have a tremendous tool available to them um, through the federal consistency process. So the federal consistency process allows a state to have a say on the federal waters. And by the way, the project has to be inconsistent with the policies enforceable policies have been adopted by the state. So the state can go somewhat above and beyond what the federal government can. So they have a tremendous tool available to them, but they have to have that in place before the development process starts. So the coastal zone agency usually does that. We use the university for collecting the data because as an agency, we're not in data collection and crunching all that information and generating spatial maps. We just didn't have those capabilities. So we use the university for that. The other thing is the universities are usually a trusted source of information because they don't have a dog in the race, so to speak, um, when it goes forward. So it, it, it's a way of sort of enhancing those two capabilities if you can sort of merge those and get the working together. But it's the state coastal zone agency that has the ability to have a say in these projects. Um, it just depends on how much the state's willing to invest in that process to, to, it will be directly proportional to say that they have to the amount of investment they make in it. Mm -hmm. Just can I, can I add a little something? So I, yeah, I, I, I think Grover's right. And I think, you know, what we have seen so far is that the states can have some, um, you know, influence through the, the federal consistency review process. The problem is that, you know, we're hearing from other agencies, you know, we're hearing from, from NOAA that it does not consider any federal consistency review process to have any authority over project design or project decision making. It is simply a review and that's that. And, and we're hearing, honestly, conflicting things from different people at, at BOEM about how, how they approach it. And while on the one hand, the law is the law, on the other hand, the CZMA is, a, is a, the Coastal Zone Management Act, sorry, for our European colleagues, is a uh, is very complicated law, right? That, that has quirks in, in its application and in uh, how well decisions made under it are, are upheld as they go through review. Um, it, but that said, you know, I, I think that's all the more reason that, you know, ha having a conflict between multiple agencies for multiple projects is all the more reason to up 
up, to put the planning up front as much as you can, um, because it's really not helpful for anyone, as, as certainly everyone on this panel well knows, um, to wait until the last stages of a project to have these conflicts arise. Um, and so that, that I think was the real benefit of the SAMP was, was putting a lot of these decisions up front. Even still, there, there were some last minute difficulties and you know, particularly for, for fishing industry and getting to a point where you're effectively using their expertise and actually effectively minimizing conflicts, that is the worst case scenario. You know, to have this sort of upfront wishy-washy, who knows what's going on, and then the last minute, you know, as Grover said, you have you have this deadline, you have this clock, you know, everything has to be decided right now. And I think, you know, a lot of that is that we really don't have a lot of transparency right now with where along the way the key project decisions are being made. Um, you know, you go to a public meeting and you hear that those decisions are being made through the bond process. And as long as you submit your comments on the draft, you know, on the environmental assessment for the lease issuance and on the environmental impact statement for, for the construction and operations plan, you know, as long as you do that, you're gonna be fine and your interests are gonna be accounted for. And we know that they're not, right? We know that a lot of those decisions are made when the proposals go in for the power purchase agreement, when the, when the lease sites are identified, you know, there's all these steps along the way that don't really have that transparent public participation that fishermen are used to experiencing through fishery management councils and the way that fish stocks are managed. John or Mary? Jennifer, yeah, please, Jennifer, John. I can just throw in there, I, I, and, I, and, I'm, and Annie loves when I agree with her. I, I, I'm gonna agree with her on, on, on point. Uh, planning up front is critical, right? So the, the developers, the last thing they wanna, they wanna do is end up in a, in a, in a ring essentially with, 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 with angry folks that uh, feel like they haven't been heard uh, before the areas were identified. That's, it's, you know, absolutely not what we want. I think planning up front is key to, to, you know, look at the data, look at the evidence, how is the area used and pick the right areas. There is to be, there is no perfect spot. Someone's gonna, someone's gonna have a problem with a spot that's picked, but planning up front is critical. What I do want to say is that it, as much as we say that we, some folks feel that they haven't been heard. If you go back and look at what some of these projects look like, you know, from, from day one and where they're at now, there are massive changes. And those changes were, were not made because the developers wanted to, okay? It's not, it's certainly not ideal to, to way that we, to lay out a, an offshore wind farm, the way that some of these uh, projects are currently laid out. It's less than ideal. It's not optimal for, for uh, catching wind and generating, generating energy. It's, is it doable? Yes, but it's only being done because of the fishermen and other people and other ocean users have had a very strong voice over, and, and I know people disagree with that, but there have been massive project changes, cable, complete cable route changes, complete layout changes, spacing, orientation. I mean, this has been years that we've been, we've been at this. And I know that not everyone's gonna agree with that, but that, you know, what, we, what, we, what is clear is the, is the amount of changes that have gone into these projects based on stakeholder input. Here's a question that it's a little different than what we're talking about. Um, so, for example, we have recreational fishermen on the on the webinar, and there's a question about have do you consider you know we're talking about avoid and mitigate. John and Mary, do you guys have conversations about well you know how what are the positive effects of siting a turbine in a certain area to maybe serve as an artificial reef or to help with navigation, dare I say. Um, do you guys ever think about it that way or is it always avoid and mitigate? I, I, I might have to leave that one to Mary because you know the developer <laughs> isn't involved in yeah. the identification. Sorry, Mary, but we, we no, don't choose but, the but areas. Certainly right? in, in our environmental assessment, environmental impact statement, I, I think it's it feels very overwhelming sometimes because it really, it's supposed to bring to the decision maker all the impacts and generally and maybe it's almost human nature to focus on all the negatives but it's also supposed to bring to bear the positives and the beneficial impacts um, there's certainly the artificial reef effects we've been out studying the block island wind farm for several years we hope to have a report published this summer obviously they're completely encrusted with uh, mussels there's fish around them we have video with all the fish um, we certainly know the fishermen are out there because our people are out there sampling and the fishermen are, are, are there at the same time. And, and so to some fishermen, especially recreational fishermen, it's probably seen as a positive. 
I said they saw a lot of black sea bass out there off Block Island. I know that's a, a positive. Um, so we try, we're also supposed to report that out in, in the impact statements or our evaluations or our reports. So we don't, you know, but not everybody thinks that's a benefit either. So it depends on who you talk to. But yes, in terms of are they fish attraction devices? Absolutely. Will they be? Absolutely. Um, there's not going to be any talk of prohibiting recreational fishermen. The only prohibitions would be on certain gear types because it's just not compatible to be dragging across where there may be a cable um, that's, you know, that needs to be worked out, but certainly not recreational fishermen and there's no intent or discussion at all about preventing them from fishing right up around the, the platforms as is occurring at Block Island right now. Okay. Another question. Jen, that, okay. Jen, I'd just like yeah, to, let me just, sorry, just let me just backpedal for a second, just, just to clarify. So for the developers, you know, in the, in the owner operators of the projects, we, we have zero right or authority to restrict access to a, to an offshore wind farm. And, you know, the projects are being designed to continue once they're, once construction is complete, then the ocean users that use the area before will still have the right and access to navigate and use the area again. So we, we don't, the developers and all operators of the project don't have the right to restrict access. Uh, cables will be buried uh, to the appropriate depth as, you know, as, as Mary knows, th those, uh, that's covered by BOEM and then in state waters, it's covered by the state as well. So that is a key, a key issue I think that gets lost quite a bit is that, you know, the developers don't, don't have any interest in restricting access. But they also don't have any right to do so. So, and the Coast Guard has also come out on the record to state that uh, vessels will still re retain the, the, the freedom of navigation within wind farms, um, as, and as well as they will continue to, to service the wind farms for search and rescue uh, and provide those, those key services in, in the wind farms. But I think it does get lost uh, in a lot of the discussions is, is the goal and the benefits of offshore wind in general. I know there are very, very important concerns and issues to work through, but at the end of the day, we fisheries are changing. I think everyone will agree with that. The waters are warming. Something has to be done. And no, no choice is clear and perfect, but what we're trying to do is, is to help stop climate change. And, and these offshore wind farms are going to go a very long way to do that. Something has to be done. And I think there are a lot of benefits. And, and we see a lot of those benefits out at Block Island. Even though it's a five turbine project, I know folks uh, don't, don't like me to bring it up all the time, but it you know, it's a successful project. It's it's operating successfully, and we see we see coexistence out of Block Island uh, every day. Great, Grover, you were also part of of the Northeast Regional Ocean Plan, and um, obviously, NROC has established a data portal. Um, so there's a lot of information. Um, and, and this brings in state entities as well as federal. Um, how could the Gulf of Maine use, um, let's just call them the NROC tools or the Northeast tools um, to move the process forward, especially with pre-planning, for example? Yeah, during the ocean SAMP, we did not have any of that data available. In fact, we had to fight to get some of the data that's active, that's very easy to access through the portal these days. The portal has a tremendous amount of information. They're improving that uh, almost on a daily basis in terms of uh, taking data sets and refining them, breaking them out further, giving more utility to those data sets than previously existed. So it's a tool that is very helpful in the screening process. Um, once you get down to a site, then obviously you have to develop much more specific data for that site. But it's a screening tool to help you look at uh, many of the issues that you have to um, consider when you're in the planning process for this, it is a very helpful tool. And as I said, it's being enhanced uh, almost daily uh, in terms of its capability. Um, both uh, the federal agencies and NROC are investing a lot in trying to improve that tool and uh, also Marco down the Middle Atlantic. I, I have kind of a, a, a general question that's really not for anybody in particular, but I think what I, you know, I'm hearing kind of a lot of alignment on the general concept of the importance and value of, of broad stakeholder engagement in the process. But I think 
clearly the, there are challenges with the structures that are in place at the state and organizational level to, to, to manage the process effectively. I'm, I'm wondering, and there are also, you know, important data needs that require a lot of investment and, and capacity to work on those, uh, providing that data and making it available in a usable form. But we exist in kind of a, a you know, we're constrained by how much money can be invested, how much expertise can be directed at this. And so I think it really forces kind of creative thinking. And I'm wondering if any of the panelists have any kind of, uh, you know, kind of out of the box ideas about how, you know, you, you know, some of these connections can be made or to leverage the opportunities that are around sort of alignment on the general interest in, in the right process um, that might help, help inform what we're doing here in, in the Gulf of Maine. This is wide open and, and fairly general, but are there any kind of, um, you know, creative ideas, I guess, that, that anybody has that they'd like to kind of float? We're all ears. I can start off if you want. The, when the Ocean Sand, when we developed it, um, it was sort of obviously first in the nation to, to attempt this. Um, and so we gathered a lot of information, uh, but also, I was given the task by our governor to get down to essentially a pad ready site that we could permit uh, through both state and federal processes. So I had to gather a lot more detailed information for those sites to make sure that we were able to issue permits at the end of the day. Um, however, there are pressure points within the system that are important to each state. You don't need the amount of data perhaps that we gathered through the ocean SAMP you need to focus in on what those pressure points are for your state and gather data specific to those areas. There are areas you're obviously gonna to wanna to focus in and try to influence during the decision-making process. You need to focus in on those areas uh, that are important to you and not necessarily gather a lot of data that you may not be able to use. I see some states gathering data, for instance, on uh, whale and marine mammals and those types of things. There's some, um, theory out there that there may be federal preemption in those areas. So we may not want to waste a lot of time uh, gathering data on those types of things when you can focus in on the areas that are really important to you. I, I have another question relevant to, to what Eric sort of said is, you know, we're talking about collecting a lot of data um, based on existing existing work and then eventually to set up monitoring and whatnot. Given that, I mean, we may not see the whole 2000 wind turbines out there, but we will see wind farms out there and there will be change. And one reason why our organization wants to partner so, so much with District Cafe is because they're an innovation hub and they keep telling us to pivot to the next thing. And I've never heard the word pivot more than, and, and, and so I'm just wondering, you know, we're being pulled into conversations about, well, are there multi-use strategies? And, and so uh, granted, we really do need to now, you know, understand and, and, and pre-plan. I, I totally get that. But is there another, um, I, I always wonder with the Ocean Samp, well, what if we focused on investing in looking at technologies for, you know, okay, well, and we, we care so much about our commercial and our fishing industry, and it's so part of who we are and what we do, and it's a, it's a great cultural and economic um, aspect of who we are. But do we need to invest in looking at multi-use strategies? Um, um, do we need to um, see, well, maybe we need to look at different gear types. And I know, I, I know people are doing this, so I, I know this isn't just Jen's idea. This is, being, this is happening to see, okay, maybe in five years, the commercial industry or maybe tourism and recreation doesn't look the way it does right now. So my question is, is should we also be investing in what do we want this to look like in five years? Just Rowing that out. Can, can I speak to that, Jen? Yes, please. Um, I think that's absolutely right. I think we do have to be looking at technological innovations, potential, you know, gear innovations, all of that kind of stuff. The question is, you know, who leads that effort? If, if you don't have fishermen on board and the guys that are on the water and the guys that are buying those boats and operating those boats on board um, with 
figuring out how to do that and working on those projects, it's, it's you know, all the innovation gonna get you anything because you're not getting the expertise you need. Um, you know, I also feel like I have to push back a little bit on, you know, what we hear a lot is like, oh, you know, there's just not enough resources to, to pay for science and, and, it's, and it's so strapped. I mean, the optics are, are, are pretty bad. I mean, we've got, you know, these leases are $135 million. You know, you, there's wind conferences every week where it's sponsorship table is, you know, $25,000, $75,000. I mean, $75,000 would give you a really nice little pilot project in the lobster fishery to start wrapping your head around <laughs> Gulf of Maine data, right? And so, you know, I'm, I don't work for a wind company. I don't know how those financial decisions get made. I don't work for a state. I don't work for the federal government. But the optics and, and the way it appears is not that there isn't money available, but just that honestly, people don't care. Um, and that, that is a real problem. And I think we have to take a step back and say, you know, these lease areas have been pushed off shore for viewshed issues. Every other user group, the conflict has been minimized in the siting of these. And so as a result, they are right on fishing grounds. Knowing that, let's devote all the resources we're spending to conflict minimization, to outreach, to PR, to all of these things, and really truly try to solve these problems. It's not the way we're approaching it right now. I have a question for Annie. Can you talk a little more about, I know, I think Rhoda got some money from NYSERDA to collect fishing data or put it together. Can you talk a little more about that project? Yeah, sure thing. So um, that's the project we're working called the Fisheries Knowledge Trust. Um, and we did get a grant from NYSERDA last year just for a one year pilot phase. Um, and we're working with a scientist called Dr. John Manderson. Um, as well as with some, um, some sort of IT big, big data information specialist. And, and the purpose of that project is to work with a group of fishermen who have a long experience working with Dr. Manderson through cooperative research um, and have a lot of trust in, in his approaches to science and data to work with fishermen so that they can um, develop their own hypotheses about um, what they see is going on on the water and what they know and use their own proprietary data to create products um, that they can use to present that information more effectively in the management process. Um, so right now, the pilot project with NYSERDA is focused on offshore wind in the New York bite. Um, there's two pilot fisheries that we're working with. Um, one is the um, herring mackerel fishery, and the other is the clam fishery, which is still in, in very early stages. Um, and we're using that pilot to build an infrastructure system to house that data and use it and to build out a governance system um, so that there is sort of a trusted repository of data, but that you have the proper permissions that nobody can see that data, that the data owners don't want to see it, that it's only used for, for what they want it to use for and that they can relinquish, or they can, um, sorry, pull the, pull the data down off the, off the infrastructure anytime. So that's a pretty exciting project. Um, we were super excited to get funding for it. It's something that we've been wanting to do and talking about for years. Um, but, you know, again, <laughs> Sometimes people say, oh, you know, this is what we have to do for all of these because then we can use fishermen's proprietary data. Obviously not that, not that easy. It's going to be different for every fishery. There's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of data and infrastructure and that kind of stuff involved. And we certainly hope to grow that and grow it. Um, and, and, you know, we're working on that now. Great. And, and Jen, I'd just like to add, so not to, not to disagree, but I think there has been uh, quite a bit of science and Mary can, uh, out of anyone can, can talk about the science that's been done at Block Island. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's many, many years now and, and you know, it's, it's, it's come quickly. It's added up quickly. I think, you know, when we look back, there's, there's quite a bit of science done out at Block Island. Again, small, small sample size. But I think the, the projects in general from speaking for all the developers, you know, there is a lot of science that, that, that's happening now that's going to have to happen in the, in the future. Uh, I don't think there's a developer out there that says they're not going to do science. Um, I, you know, we know science is critical. It has to happen at the project level, but it also has to happen at the regional level. And we ha we've made some progress there. I mean, I think there's a lot of people on this call when I look through the names that, you know, we all sat in room, you know, several years ago and tried to sort out how are we going to get to regional science? How are we going to get the federal the state, the state agencies, the private, private, you know, business, the fishermen, everyone to agree how to do regional science. Well, you know, at several points we threw up our hands and all walked out, you know, shook hands and walked out the room. But I, I think we're, 
where great progress has been made, and, and Andy can expand on that, is ROSA. I think ROSA is a, a real huge step forward for all involved. Um, you know, I, I think that, that right there is a, is a success story. I, you know, it's early on. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, it's not a check the box. Um, but I, I think that right there is, is, is a good example of, of developers, of fishermen, of science coming together and, and working together on, on, on good solutions to gather more data. Listen, I, I worked in oceanography for, for 15 years. I never met a scientist that didn't want more data or have another project to, to propose. And we think that's great, you know, but we also, again, have to, have to figure out to pl how to plug that into each project. And each project can't do every, when, when people say they want more science, but they don't provide any more, any, more, any more flavor than that. I think there's been a lot of good studies that have been designed and there's gonna be a lot more to come. And those, and those will be funded but a lot of money has been spent today and, and a lot more money will be. Can I make a, a clarifying comment? So, you know, I, I didn't mean to imply that developers are not spending money on science because they certainly are. Um, and, you know, the leasehold, all of the leaseholding developers in, in New England have, um, have worked with us to set up ROSA to coordinate regional science, which is fantastic and have committed some, um, you know, first year funding to that and hopefully that's that's long-term funding i was talking about more the lack of science funding on the, on the planning side and you know mm -hmm. you can't certainly when you're starting to look at siting and you need data you, what what developers got to pay for that if they don't have that lease right i mean so I, I actually don't think that that necessarily should be the purview of any one developer before they have a lease because they have no assurance of getting that so so why should they be paying for that i think that needs to be a more collective effort i mean when you know that the, an area is going to be developed, you know that there's going to be impacts to the 60 year time series of NIMS survey data that we base all of our stock assessments on, or you know, the overwhelming majority of, of the information in the stock assessments is coming from that, and there's going to be an impact to that. You know, you, you don't wait until a project's leased and, and, and has a developer and then ask the developer to pay for that. You need to figure out how to do that up front. So Annie, just a, a question, given that, uh, again, I know Rhoda and Rosa are new and you are working probably 28 hours in a 24 hour day. I totally understand that. Um, you know, you, in the beginning, you talked about, you know, the need for the fishing community to, you know, um, present the information to make sure it's upfront, to make sure it's, it's, um, it's often and um, conversations are transparent and whatnot. Um, that, my understanding, tell me, my understanding is with Rhoda and Rosa, all of the, that need, and tell me if I, um, will be um, dealt with, or, um, or, or we, will, we will be in a better place with Rhoda and Rosa here for the Gulf of Maine. Is that true, or what else does Rhoda and Rosa need in order to um, fill that gap? I sure hope that's true. <laughs> I hope we're <laughs> leading everyone to a better place. Um, yeah, so so Rosa right now um, is sort of southern New England and North Carolina, so there's a little bit of an open question um, what, what Rosa's role will be in the Gulf of Maine and floating projects, I think. Um, I will say that, that, you know, for those that don't know, Rosa has a, an executive director as of February, um, Dr. Lindy heist who's who's awesome, and I encourage you guys to work with her and maybe invite her to future events. Um, so, you know, for a little while, I was sort of doing the sort of organ admin type stuff to, to set up Rosa, but now that, that's a fully fledged organization. Um, so I don't want to speak too much, um, you know, for, for what Lindy's doing, but hopefully, um, yes, that is a place that the states and... Um, the federal regulators and, and the developers and, and the fishing communities, recreational and commercial, can can come together. Um, and you know, and a big goal there is is to make more efficiencies in the science. You know, for whatever money is getting spent, let's let's make sure it's not being spent twice on the same thing. You know, it really is kind of that simple. And lessons we're learning in other regions, how can we apply those to other regions, and um, and all of that kind of stuff. And on the Rota side. Um, yeah, I mean, we can definitely, we've, we've made a lot of progress with organizing fishermen and getting out information in ways um, that I think is useful to, to everybody, right? It's, um, I don't, I don't want to call it a one-stop shop because we don't call every single fisheries permit holder in the country before <laughs> we <laughs> give information, but we certainly do the best we can. Um, and, you know, but, but Rhoda is a 
an association that's funded off of membership dues. Um, we step, when we organize, I think we, people perceive that we, we filled a void, um, that it was really hard to get that fisheries information and to have that, that sort of unified voice from the fishing industry. And we get asked to do a lot by, by states and federal government and, and other people. And, um, you know, we're, we're funded off of dues. And so it's not, I'm not saying that this is, <laughs> I'm not making a pitch that people should fund Rota, but there are limitations to what a group like ours can do and, you know, the extent of organization that's needed and how that sort of integrates with everything else. Great. Um, we are close to wrapping up. Um, panelists, um, do you have any last words or Eric, do you have a, a, a simple question you'd like to ask? I don't have any simple questions, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, I've got something for, for, for Eric especially because we're talking about, you know, the Gulf of Maine and interest in the Gulf of Maine as a new area. I, I think something to remember is that while there's a lot of lessons that can be learned, I think there's a lot of improvements that can be made in the process. Something to remember is that, that all areas are unique. And certainly the Gulf of Maine is extremely a unique ecosystem uh, compared to other places, right? So while all those lessons can be learned, I think what we've heard today is processes can be, continue to be improved upon Remember that your area is unique. What what some what things that may have worked in some areas may not work in other areas. So, you know, data and evidence. It ha everything has to be data and evidence based, right? So, gathering data early on on that unique area in the Gulf of Maine as much as you can uh, will be critical. And and you know, getting getting people heard early is also critical. And I think it was a good point made. Not waiting till the area is leased. Um, right. So that would be my 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 bit of advice. Thank you, John. I was going to add, I think, speaking to the science and the data, the bone process does not require two years of pre-construction data to establish the abundance and distribution within those areas. To the extent that states can go out and collect that data uh, and have it on hand before the leasing process starts, I think, is very valuable. Once the leasing process has been completed and a lease has been issued to a company, the first thing they send in is a series of vessels that are doing geophysical surveys. And while there's no scientific data to show that perhaps that there's a direct impact and pinging in these areas, anecdotally from our fishermen, uh, it does seem to have an impact on the fishery, which then affects the abundance of distribution of the fishery prior to the construction. So you want to get that baseline so you have a valid comparison for later on when, when you start to do the work. One thing uh, I'll just add uh, to everybody here, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, next Friday's my last day at work in this job and it's been a pleasure uh, and an honor uh, to, to do it. And I wish all of you good luck going forward in the offshore wind industry. And, and Grover, you beat me to it. I did want to recognize that you are retiring. You are an amazing resource um, on this topic. Um, I hope we can count on you. We know you're not moving away too far. So um, we, I have your cell phone number. So I will sell it to anyone for the highest bidder. So thank you, Grover, for all that you have done um, for Rhode Island and also for the region. We are, we are so blessed and lucky to have you um, in our presence. So Send us the virtual uh, cocktail hour uh, retirement party. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. So thanks. We'd be happy to host that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Cheers to um, Grover. Good. We really appreciate you joining us and um, uh, thank you for coming and